Welcome back to Computer Science 4303. Um, today, I'm excited to be talking about Assignment 3. I think this one will be really fun. Uh, assignment 3, to get, you know, the vast majority of the marks in this assignment, I don't think it's a lot of work. Uh, but, in order to get some of the bonus marks, um, I think there's some fun things that you can do. So just a quick note, uh, last class's Twitch VOD was accidentally deleted. Apologies for that if you like watching on Twitch, but um, it's still available on the YouTube playlist if you're following along there. Um, and just to type this in the chat for people, there you go, if you want to uh, follow along with the playlist for the course. So assignment three, let's just jump right into it. Um, first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the solution for assignment three and what you should be doing uh, to, to actually get the marks on the assignment. And then I'll go through the code and um, some examples and stuff like that to show you exactly how you do it. So for people who are out there who are not in the course, um, this, is, uh, this lecture is a bit of a tease because you won't be getting the files. Um, this is the assignment for the class and unfortunately because of the possibility of cheating or solutions being released out there, I am not going to be releasing the assignment to the general public. Okay, so without further ado, here is assignment three. So for assignment three, what essentially we're going to be doing is making this like stripped down 2D version of No Man's Sky. Okay, so if you've seen No Man's Sky, it's like an infinitely procedurally generated universe. And uh, there are planets in that universe, and this is what we're doing for our assignment. So you can see here, uh, we have a, a, a almost literally infinitely large universe with different stars and stuff in it. So for example here in the UI that I've released with the assignment, uh, you can see my mouse there, I hope. So if I hover over a star, um, it has a bunch of properties. So let's, let's zoom in here on a, on a few stars. So this star is called New Pi. 787. It has a particular integer seed. It has a position in the universe. It has a radius and a temperature. And if we see here, it actually has two planets. So if I click on this planet, then a little status bar appears on the bottom with all of that information showing the, uh, the, the star system. And then on the bottom, it also has a number of planets that I can toggle between. Let me uh, choose a planet that has, or a star system that has more planets so I can show you this. So this planet, uh, this star system, for example, has five planets. So down here in the UI, I can toggle back and forth between which planet I want to choose. Planets have different colors and they also have different sizes. So you can see here this green planet. If I click the space bar, we can actually visit this planet. And if I look at it, um, the terrain is green and it has like uh, a certain texture or terrain to it that we'll be generating uh, using a cellular automata. So this was a very small planet. If I hit escape, I go back to the main view. And then if I choose this larger planet right here, which is sort of a purplish color or a pinkish color, if I click that, we see that there's a much larger planet um, with, with um, much more interesting texture. And all of the planets have their own textures. Uh, they each have their own sort of layouts. All of that is uh, pseudo-randomly generated with stuff that we've been doing from the past couple of lectures. Uh, something of note here is that you may ask, how can you possibly store an infinite universe, right? That, if I, if I right-click and drag and just keep going and keep going and keep going, sorry if the, this induces a little bit of motion sickness, it really is infinite to the point where, um, to, to like the double floating point precision, right? So this will keep going forever and ever and ever. And the cool thing is nothing, and I do mean absolutely nothing that you see on the screen is being stored, okay? So what happens is if I press the G key here, you can sort of see this grid, uh, crap. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit dark. Can you tell me if you can see the grid on the screen? Uh, so there's no grid, grid, no grid, grid. I, th I think you can see the grid. Um, just someone let me know. Barely. Okay. Well, there is a grid and that grid has a specific size. And what happens is um, when the user interface is 
zoomed in to a particular location on the screen, what happens is nothing else in the universe exists right now. On each frame, at 60 frames per second, we are using the techniques that we've learned in the class for PCG to dynamically generate everything that you see on the screen every frame of the game. So I have another key here. So if I press the K key in the user interface, it's actually going to save that area of the screen that I was just looking at, okay? So if I pan off of the screen right now, none of that stuff that was in that area exists anymore. It's not stored in memory whatsoever. But if I pan back to that area, it all regenerates in the exact same way. So even though we haven't stored it, it's being regenerated in the exact same way. So how is that happening? Well, what we're doing is we're using the X, Y location of the planet, or sorry, we're using the X, Y location of the grid as a seed for our random number generation. So for example, what happens here is that I break up the universe into grid cells, okay? So here's some grid cells. And then in our procedural content generation algorithm, we go through each of these grid cells and the X, Y location of that cell is the seed for our lemur RNG function that we talked about uh, two lectures ago. And based on a variable, which is like, how likely is there a star system to be at this cell, we either generate a star system at that cell or we don't generate a star system at that cell. So it's really cool, it's really easy, and it's just a bunch of random numbers essentially. And then when you click um, on a star system, that generates the planet. So the only thing that actually is stored um, from frame to frame in this user interface or in this assignment is the planet terrain. So rather, like, rather than, you know, if the planet is up on the screen, this terrain is actually stored and continuously drawn to the screen. But as soon as I get away from the planet, that, that terrain is no longer stored, but if I go back to the planet, it regenerates it in the exact same way. So if I look up here in the top uh, left corner, you can see this structure almost looks like a head and an arm here. So if I go back out, that texture has been completely been deleted from memory. And if I hit it again, it regenerates the exact texture from scratch and displays it back to the screen, okay? So the whole point here is that we're generating content on the fly as we go and displaying it to the screen and that is like the very heart of procedural content generation. Now, you can zoom out pretty far here. It starts to lag a little bit and probably my bit rate is going to crap right now because of, uh, because of this. Oh, look, this is pretty cool. You can see sort of a, a constellation here of blue stars. Um, the stars are actually colored based on their temperature. So a randomly generated temperature determines the, um, the color of the stars. So that's the assignment. Um, I don't think I'm missing much, but what we're going to do is we're going to go over the readme file and the readme file will tell you exactly what we have to do. And anything that I've missed, I will get in the readme file. And then I'll open up the Visual Studio project and I'll go through the code and tell you exactly what you have to do for the assignment. So I think this is one that is pretty fun. Oh, look, this is a pretty cool little constellation and I can save that. And, and the saving of it, it just stores a rectangle. It does, it actually doesn't um, like save any of these planets or star systems or anything. It just draws a rectangle um, to the screen. Someone asked, what are the dots under the planet? Oh, good, uh, good question. So the dots under the planet here, uh, that's just the number of moons that the planet has. So the moons are only visible right here. And so it's just, it's just another random data point um, that we can generate. And you can see that if I click on this uh, star system right here, uh, this there's four planets, 2003 with the moons. If I click over here, oh look, there's a bunch more stuff, but if I click back, it still regenerates all the stuff. So the key takeaway from this assignment really is that we can use the location of something in the universe as the seed, and then the seed for generating the planets and the seed for generating the properties of all the planets can be based on that initial seed, which was based on the location of the star system. And so that's how we do this procedural content generation. It's, it's, it may not have been obvious at first how we can do that, but once you know how it's done, um, 
you can probably pretty easily actually um, implement it on your own. So let's go back here. I'm going to pull up a darker background uh, so that I can go into the readme file. Okay, so just give me a second. I'm going to take a drink and then I'll go over the readme file. All right, so here's the readme file for this assignment. And just as always, I'm going to go through it all to make sure that I haven't missed anything. So for this assignment, you will zip and submit the entire source directory only. So this is the exact same as assignment two. Okay, you, you right click and uh, submit the, the source directory. This means that you will not be submitting any changes you have made to the Visual Studio project and you can't create any additional files. Any additional functions or methods that you create must be contained in existing source files. You may add any number of helper classes or functions to, uh, I meant to say, existing files, but please do not modify any of the variable names or functions that are already present, as they may be used by the user interface to function properly. So what that means is, for example, uh, under a star system or the planet class, um, there might be like a get name function. Don't modify the names of any of those functions because they are used for the user interface um, in order to be able to draw it correctly. And you, of course, you have to put in all your student names and um, and your group members, etc. And please put that at the top of universe.h, which is the file that we will be checking. Okay, program specification. So in this assignment, you will be computing an in infinite universe using procedural content generation. Your tasks are as follows with sample code provided in universe.cpp. So I'm going to go over um, that after I've gone through the readme file. So the first thing you have to do is the star system generation. Your first main task is to implement star system generation by generating pseudo random number generator, so PRNG values, which you can use to assign various properties of a star system. The star system struct can be seen in universe.h, which contains several variables that are commented within the universe.h file. So let's just go have a look at that really quickly. Um, so here is the universe.h file, and I'll be going over this in more detail, but you can see that I have given you a planet structure. So for those of you who haven't seen struct before, struct is essentially a class, but everything in it is public unless declared otherwise. So here's a struct called planet, and here's a struct called star system. Okay, so you can see here, for example, in the star system, this is the X and Y position of the star in the universe. We have a seed, a name, a color, a radius, a temperature, a number of planets, and then each star system has a vector of planets, and planets have a bunch of properties like the terrain, the seed, the radius, etc. So I have given you all of that, um, and I have also commented over here whether or not uh, the functions have been given for you and already filled out, or is it something that you need to uh, work on and generate yourself. So you can go through this uh, as sort of a checklist while you're doing the assignment, because pretty much unless you do a bunch of bonus functionality, um, universe.h and universe.cpp are the only files that you should have to edit in the entire uh, program. The rest of the files you, that you see here in Visual Studio are all for the user interface. Okay, so let's go back to the readme file. All of the code for star system generation should be performed in the function universe generate star xy, which generates and returns a star system object that is to be drawn slash interacted with in the GUI. The GUI will call this function for each XY location on each frame that the program is running with no persistent storage for the star system objects. This means that the code that generates these objects must be as fast as possible. This is why the getName function generates the name of the star only when the function is called so that we are not needlessly generating the names of stars when they are not being displayed. So what this means is when, when your universe generate star function is called, you are literally generating that entire star system every time that function is called. You're not trying to be clever and store it in a map or something like that. You are just generating it whenever that function is called. Okay. 
The color of the star you generate should be based on the temperature of the star, with the specific values given inside the universe.cpp sample code. An image has been included with the assignment in the root folder of various star temperatures and their associated colors. So if I go back here, uh, I can open up this starsystem.png file. And what I've given you, you is um, a map that I found online between the temperature of stars and their colors. So what I want you to do is when you generate the color for a star, or sorry, when you generate the temperature for a star, I want you to set the color of the star based on these values, okay? Now, they don't necessarily have to be uh, linearly generated, but as long as like a, a cooler temperature is in the red spectrum, middle is in the yellow spectrum, and higher is in the blue spectrum, that's really what I want you to do, okay? So that's one little extra thing that you have to work on. So that's what that was. Um, so for this task, you must work within the following functions. So you have the universe generate star and the star system get name. So what do I mean by get name? So if I run the assignment again really quick, each star has an associated name. So for example, this if I mouse over it, it's beta mu 51. This one is beta kappa 387. This one is delta rho 287. So what I have done to generate the names of my star systems is I just have an array of all the Greek letters. And then when I go to generate the randomized name for that, based on the seed of the star system, I take two random Greek letters and a random three digit number. That's it. And so that's what I've done to generate mine. I want you to do something different than that, but it should be interesting right? It shouldn't just be like star one, star two, star three. I want you to do something interesting and make it kind of sci-fi if you can. That would be nice. Okay. So the user interface, uh, just as a note, will make call to various XY locations within the universe based on a grid system, since making calls to every possible XY location would be far too slow. The size of this grid can be seen in config.hpp, and by default it is a square with sides of size 256. This will not change in the marking process and should not be changed unless you are testing some specific bonus feature. So what does that mean? Well, if I go back to the solution code, each of these grid cells are in the... so, so this is the first assignment where really we're kind of getting into a little bit of game programming. So you can see here that I can zoom out and that I can zoom in. So in the universe coordinate system, each of these grid cells is 256 units wide and 256 units high, okay? So if I mouse over, um, like, let me see here, this star, for example, all right, here we go. Look at this. This is this is a really interesting uh, example. So this star happened to be generated at position zero zero. Okay, so position zero zero. This is the this happens to be the cell that has x coordinate zero and y coordinate um, zero. If I go over by two and down by one, now I'm at x location two and y location one, and you see here that the position of this star in the universe is 512 in the x direction and 256 in the y direction. And the reason for that is because in the universe coordinate system, each of these grid cells is 256 wide and 256 high. Okay, so that, that's just explaining why these, uh, when you mouse over the position, it's not the same as like the xy location of the coordinate of the grid. Okie doke. Let's go back to the readme file. So a also a sample lamer PRNG function has been provided in universe.cpb. I used the exact function for the solution. However, you can modify if you need for any reason. So if I go over here into universe.cpp, I have provided the lamer PRNG function um, which gets passed in a seed and returns a value. And that is the function that you will be using for the assignment. There is no requirement for you to ever change this function. 
okay? It works as intended. Uh, you may want to create sort of the lamer2 function that I, that I included in the slides, but you absolutely do not need to change this. I've just saved you the typing of copying it from the slides into here. One other thing that I mentioned was this config.hpp. And so inside config.hpp, rather than put all these things in a file and have you like edit the file and rerun things, I've just hard coded all of these things here for you. So whenever you go to generate star systems or planets, there are a bunch of minimum values and maximum values that you have to generate your values in between. So just for example, here is the grid size, it's 256. Here is the uh, star exist chance. And what star exist chance means is that for each cell, when we go to generate a planet or not, there is a this percentage chance that a star should exist. So if you run the assignment again, if that is 10, it means approximately one in 10 of these grid cells has a star on that grid cell, okay? So that's what that one means. And the rest of them are pretty obvious. Min and max radius, min and max planet radius, um, max planets, max moons, min star temperature, max star temperature, all of those are there for you. And they're in this config namespace. Alrighty, so that was the star system generation, and we will go into that in a bit more detail once I go in and look at the code. Second, you have to do the planet generation. So do the star system generation first, and then do the planet generation. So after you have generated the properties of the star system, you then need to generate the properties of the planets within that system. After each property has been given a value, you... Uh, then you must generate the terrain for that planet. Terrain generation is performed within the getTerrain function so that we do not generate terrain for planets which are not yet being drawn. Okay. So to generate this terrain, you must use the cellular automata method discussed in the slides. Now, you can use Perlin noise if you want for bonus marks, but I'm going to go with the fact that most people are just going to, excuse me, just going to use the cellular automata because it's much easier. By default, the terrain grid holds a value of zero, which is drawn in the GUI as the color of the planet itself. Each cell which it, with a value of one is drawn as dark gray by default. Therefore, the task of the terrain generation is to set the values of the grid to either zero or one to create an interesting terrain texture. The GUI will use the integer in the grid to index the color vector within the planet in order to assign a color to a specific cell. See the bonus section below for details on how to get bonus marks related to this. So what does that mean? So, okay, let me run the solution again. So if I click on a given planet here, so let's say I go to this orange planet and I look at it. Inside the planet structure, there's gonna be a grid of integers. Here, um, there's also going to be a vector of colors. So there's a grid of integers and a vector of colors. Whatever the grid cell holds in terms of its integer, it's going to be drawn with the color, with the integer index of that grid cell. So for example, here uh, for this planet, I have a vector of colors. The index zero will be an orangey color and index one will be a dark gray color. So any cell in this grid, which has a value of zero, is going to be drawn with the zeroth color, which happens to be orange. And any cell with a value of one is going to be drawn with the oneth color, which is the dark gray value here. So that's how, how this actually gets uh, drawn to the screen. And it's your job to use that cellular automata um, algorithm that we gave in class in order to assign this grid a value of zeros and ones so that it gets displayed to the screen. And if we go look really quickly at universe.h, so under the planet struct, okay, there is a grid of integers, that is the terrain, and it's going to be your job to fill out that grid. And there is a standard vector of SFML colors, and that is the vector of terrain colors which you are going to be generating. And I have sample code for that, so don't worry, I'll go over that in a little bit. You may construct any additional data structures or functions that you wish to aid with terrain generation. However, all of that code uh, must be contained completely within, and I will say, uh, existing 
files. So the last time I gave this assignment, I, I only had people uh, submitting universe.h and universe.cpp. But this time around, you can get bonus marks for doing cool stuff with the user interface. So if you want to do that, I'm allowing you to submit all of those files. So for that task, you must work with the universe generate star planet get terrain and planet get name functions. Here we go. Uh, this is just how to use the user interface. So the UI has been implemented for you. Once stars and planets have been implemented, it will draw them for you and allow you to, to interact with them. So you do not have to do any of the user interface for this assignment. That's all done for you. The mouse controls for this assignment, uh, you can hold down the right mouse button while moving the mouse to scroll the view in either direction with a smooth deceleration. This works for both the universe view as well as the planet view. You can mouse over any star and it will draw the information about that star to be displayed uh, in a small text box. You can left click and highlight, um, you can left click any highlighted star to display the information box on the bottom of the screen which shows the entire star system and planets, and you can zoom in and out with the mouse wheel toward a target screen area. If you do not have a mouse wheel, uh, I'm not sure what to do for you. You might be able to edit that. Uh, I think I think if you have like a, um, a trackpad or a laptop, maybe if you like double mouse in or out, uh, that might work. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but I have implemented manual zoom controls for, or keyboard zoom controls for people who may not have a mouse wheel. So, uh, the keyboard controls, the A key is sort of the left key, and that will move the planet selector left. The D key will move the planet selector right. The W key will zoom in, the S key will zoom out. The G key will toggle the drawing of the grid. The K key will save that view, that rectangle of the universe, and the L key will load a view of the universe. That really has nothing to do with the assignment. It's just interesting if you want to use it for any debugging purposes. The space key enters the planet view mode of the currently selected planet, and the escape key exits the planet view mode and the star system view mode. Okay. Uh, before I go into the, the next part, I want to go over the marking scheme. So this is the marking scheme for the assignment. Uh, this was assignment four last time I gave the, uh, the course. So of course, uh, code style, readability, all that is worth about 5%, so try and be neat. The star system generation is the easier part of the assignment, so that's worth 35% of your mark. So that involves all the properties of the star system are properly set, the color is properly set based on the temperature range of the, of the, plant, of the star system, the planets are properly added to the star's vector, and the stars are regenerated identically for the same x, y. What that means is the following. So let me just zoom in here. So you see, for example, there's these planets right here. Just remember this structure, okay? If I zoom, or sorry, if I scroll so they are no longer visible, and then I scroll back, those three planets better be regenerated in the exact same way. Okay, that's what I mean by regenerated for the same x, y. The planet generation has a few more marks for it. So all the properties of the planet have to be properly set. The planet uses the star's seed and the planet number properly to, to, in order to set its values. The planet uh, terrain generation works properly. So it uses the cellular automaton method that I gave. Um, let me put this in here as well. Um, or uses Perlin noise method. Each planet CA parameters are differently set so the planets have different styles of terrain. So what that means is that whenever you generate a planet, so for example there's a bunch of different planets down here, they may have, like for example this one is a pretty dense planet, you can see there's lots of cave systems. Um, this one is a more open planet and the reason for that is when we talked about the cellular automata for cave generation, there's a bunch of different parameters that you can use in order to, to set these and tweak how your planet looks. Uh, here's a really open one, for example. So I want you, for each planet, to use um, to randomize those parameters so that they look interesting. Okie doke. Now, there's also this planet customization um, section. So in order to get full marks, I'm reserving 10% of the mark of the assignment to do some cooler stuff, all right? So what this means is that in order to get full marks, 
um, you have to have more than one color in the terrain that represents a different like terrain feature. Okay, so for example, in my solution, I only have uh, two colors here. Let me just go back to a planet. I only have two colors, but I want to see you put in something. Maybe it's like uh, like water or a mountain or something like that so that it's not just two colors. Okay, so put in something interesting for that and you will get full marks. Um... I don't know why I did that. Okay. So there are also bonus marks that you can get. And these bonus marks can make up for a feature that you didn't uh, get to implement. So you can get 5% bonus if you end up uh, implementing Perlin noise for planet generation instead of the CA. And the cool thing is if you implement Perlin noise, it's really, really easy to put more than one color into the planet customization. Right? So if you can't think of some way to do this using the um, cellular automata, if you go for the bonus marks with Perlin noise using the link I, I sent you in or I gave you in the last lecture, then you can really easily get the bonus marks too. And any other cool additional functionality, like if you put like aliens on the planets or something in the user interface, um, oops, one second. Or if you do something really cool on top of all that, then you can get up to, you know, 110 in the assignment. But the marks don't roll over. It's just, you know, you can make up for other features or other marks that you may have lost. So again, don't submit it late and only submit the zipped source folder. Unzipped. Zipped. There we go. So that's the marking scheme. And now I want to go back to the, to the detailed explanation of the, the customization and the bonus marks. So, planet colors are stored in the colors vector of the planet class. The two default colors are color zero, that's the color of the planet itself, and colors one is a dark gray color to indicate boring rocks. By default, the terrain grid of the planet class stores a grid of values indicating the color of the terrain to be drawn at the XY location. So. In order to earn the 10% customization marks for the planet, you can use multiple colors to generate interesting terrain view of the planet. Do this by adding more colors to the colors vector and by changing the integer value of the terrain grid. One way may be, for example, if you're stuck for ideas, add some natural resources to the planet, such as water, gold, silver, minerals, vespine gas, whatever. Each of these have unique colors and they can be found on various planets in interesting formations. So go crazy with that planet customization. I want to see uh, some really cool stuff. For the 5% bonus marks, you can implement Perlin noise for planet terrain generation instead of the CA. And you can also make any changes you like to any of the user interface options um, in order to make the game more interactive or fun or whatever you want. Um, another interesting idea for bonus marks is to incorporate time into your PCG for the star system or planets. So for example, you could oscillate the color of stars slightly to create a twinkling effect or have certain features of the planet based on current time, such as a day or night cycle, etc. So there's all sorts of cool stuff you can do for the bonus marks, and I will be showing, um, the coolest bonus solutions in the class. Uh, I, I really like showing those bonus solutions because I think if you work hard on the assignment, it, you know, you're not really getting much clout for that, but it's cool to, to have your stuff shown off in my opinion. Um, boo, boo, boo. Yeah, so just some hints. Implement the star system class first since it will be required in order to generate a, a planet. Get the default terrain generation working first for the planet before you attempt any bonus features. And please make sure to code and test, code and test, code and test. So you have one function, write that function, test that function before you move on to the next function. You can add any number of helper classes or functions to the universe.h or cpp files, and that includes any other file as well, but please do not modify any of the variable names or functions that are already present in those files. You will pretty quickly find that everything breaks if you do that. Okay, so that's the readme.txt. It's basically what I said um, beforehand in the, the sort of informal um, explanation of the assignment. But now we're going to look over the uh, 
sample code so you can get a, an idea for how how to actually go about implementing these things. So just give me one sec. All right, and at any point, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. I'm, I'm constantly looking over at the chat and um, no one's saying anything yet, so that's good. All right, so let me go into uh, the universe.cpp and show you what's... Actually, let's go into universe.h again first. So as I said before, um, the planet structure and the star system structure are given for you. So the variables for the planet you have to generate all of these variables for a planet. So they're given default values, but you have to set these throughout the planet generation. So for example, there's a name. Um, you have to construct that in get name. I'll show you how to do that. Um, there's the terrain. You have to construct that. There's the seed for the planet. There's the radius, the number of moons, the terrain size, and the colors. So all of these variables you have to generate um, in your assignment. Then there are some functions on this structure. Uh, two of the functions have been given for you. Um, the toString function, that is a function which prints the planet info. So let me show you what toString does. So if I go back to the assignment and I go to any given planet, the toString function gives me this string that I print up here. Okay. That's what that does. And um, the way that I check to see if a planet actually exists or not <laughs> is whether or not the radius is greater than zero. So by default, the radius of a planet is zero. And if that is not changed from zero, then the planet basically doesn't exist and it won't be drawn to the screen. Okay, so that's how I'm, how I'm working with things. Similarly, the star system um, struct has a bunch of variables. Some of them are given by the user interface and some of them you have to generate. So the X and Y location of the star system are given by the user interface, right? So we're going to be looping through and we're going to be generating a star based on whether or not um, a, a random number based on this X and Y value um, has created a star or not. And we'll, we'll go into the code that actually does that. So this star will have a seed, a name, a color, a radius, a temperature, uh, a number of planets, and the planets themselves. The getName function, you have to generate the name of the star system, but the toString and the exists function, um, I have done for you, so please don't modify those. And again, whether or not a star system actually exists is based on whether its radius has been changed. Um, so what's going to happen is that the user interface for every XY location in the grid, it's going to call this generate star function. And it's going to generate a star system and return it. If, okay, let me go into the function and I'll explain this. All right. So it's easier to explain if I open up the assignment for a second. Okay. So for every location on the grid, the user interface calls the generate star system function, okay? But you say, well, it's it's returning a star system struct, a star system object, but there only appear to be stars generated at some locations. So rather than re returning like true or false or a star exists or a star doesn't exist, it's always going to return a valid star system object whether or not a star is drawn in the user interface is based on that exists function. And so whether or not the radius has been changed from zero, that's how it knows that it exists or not. All right, so if you do not change the radius for a star from zero, it will not exist in the universe. That's what we're saying. All right, so let's go over um, the functions now. So I've gone over the lamer RNG function. Let's go over this generate star function. So inside the system namespace, there is a generate star uh, function. Within that function, you are going to generate a star and all of the planets within it. Okie doke. 
So the first thing that happens is you have to set up the star system struct and set the X and the Y value. So this is already done for you. You don't need to change this. The first thing you need to start working on is setting the random seed for the star. So you go back to the previous or two lectures ago, I think that's lecture 10 now, and you look at how you would take an X and a Y value. So you're taking two integers and you're going to use the lamer RNG function based on those two integers to generate a random number. And just so you don't have to go back, um, we will still go back and look at it. But what I would do is you can do something like this. So you have the lamer RNG function. So you can say something like star dot seed equals lamer PRNG. Now this takes in a single value, right? It doesn't take in two integers. It takes in one integer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate a pseudo random value, a pseudo random value based on the X coordinate. And then I'm going to X or that with the Y value, for example. And then what I've done is I've taken in those two values. I've created a single randomized number from those two values, and I can use that as the seed for the PRNG function. All right. So what I've done is this is just one way of doing that. Okie doke. So that's how you might set up your seed for that. So it pays to watch the lecture because part of it is done for you. So once you've set up the seed, now you can use that seed for a bunch of other things. So here is a condition on which you will do the rest of the star system generation. Um, one second here. Do, do, do. So if this condition is true, you're going to generate the rest of the star system. Otherwise, if it's not true, okay, then it's just going to return the blank star that we created with no variables in it. And because no variables have been changed, its radius is going to be zero. And so the user interface will think that it doesn't exist. Okay. So if this condition is true, then it will generate the properties of the star system. Otherwise, the default star will return with a radius of zero, causing it to not exist. You should use your star's seed value to do this computation. So remember how I had this config.hpp? This star exists chance is what I want you to use um, right here. So you could say, so for example, bool um, random value equals random value between 0 and 100. And then if random value is less than config, and then you scroll down through the variables, star exists chance, that's when you would do that. So for example, this star exists chance right now is 10%. So if you generated a random value between 0 and 100 and then said if that random value is less than the percentage chance that it should exist, this right here, this if statement should replace this if statement that I have. Now, you see this crazy formula right here. What does this mean? It means absolutely nothing. It was something that I typed in because it created something interesting. Now just watch this. If I run the assignment that I've given you, this, so this is the student assignment. This is what it produces, okay? So the function that I have, uh, all those modulus operators and stuff, it was just something cool to make this cool pattern. So it doesn't look randomized at all, and that's because it's not, right? I've just created this pattern. If I mouse over all the stars, they all have um, seed zero. Uh, they've been given some radius in order to just exist, but that's about it. Okay, so if I click on them, they all have the same number of planets, et cetera, et cetera. And that's because they haven't been randomly generated properly. Okay. So everything that you just saw in there, oh, let me run that again. So for example, when I click on a star, each of them have eight planets, they're all red, um, et cetera. And I've hard coded these values so that you have example code to work with when you actually go to generate your star. So let's go back to the code now and see how I gave values to the star um, for all the planets, etc. Alrighty. So all of the randomized properties of the system that you created should depend on star.seed. So here I've given the uh, radius 
a radius of grid size over two. So this should be set randomly between min and max radius, but what I've done is just give them all the same size. I've set the star's temperature equal to zero. This should be set by you randomly in between the minimum and the maximum temperature. Then what you have to do is you have to set the color of the star, or sorry, yeah, so you have to set the color of the star based on the temperature. So what I've done is I've actually put in these values for you. So if we go back um, to this, one second, let me kind of load this up here. If we go back to this diagram that I gave out and I try and zoom in just a little bit, okay. So what I've done essentially is say, if it's less than 6,000, then it should fade from red to yellow, right? So if it's under 6,000, it should be fading from red to yellow. Um, otherwise, if it's above 6,000, between 6 and 10,000, then it should fade from yellow to white. And it's above 10,000, then it should fade from white to, to light blue, okay? So that's what this does. You have to fill that in. Um, right now, I've just set all the colors as white. So for example, if instead I had uh, the green value set to zero here, then red and group blue makes purple. So all of my stars should have a purple color if I roll this. Okay, and they all have a purple color. Perfect. Now, once I've set all of those values for the star, I have to set the number of planets. So what I've done here is I've just hard coded the number of planets to eight, but you have to set that randomly between the minimum and the max number of planets. And remember that when you set it randomly, it has to be based on the star's seed somehow, right? So in order to, to regenerate the same information each time, you have to be doing something like I did with the lamer RNG function up top. All right, so once you've generated a random number of planets, then for each planet, you're going to create a planet structure. You're going to set its seed, radius, moon, and terrain size. And then uh, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do something to generate that planet's terrain. So what I've done for you right here is I've done an example where I just um, set the colors of the uh, planet, or, sorry, the terrain of the planet. And then this right here, the p.colors array, if we go look at p.colors, what is that? It's a standard vector of SFML colors. Then these are the colors that will be drawn to the screen. So for example, if I set the green value um, of the terrain for the dark rock, so instead of dark gray, it's gonna be green now. When I go to a planet, um, it's gonna be green. Now this planet doesn't really have any interesting features, but I've shown you how to change the color, okay? So essentially what I've done, uh, where have I done that? Where is my planet's terrain? Okay, so there's another function here that is called by the user interface. So you are not calling the terrain generation of the function of the planet when you generate the planet. So, so why, why is that? So note, generate the planet's terrain only in the planet get terrain function. This way we only spend time generating a planet's terrain if it, will, it will, if it will be viewed. Otherwise the universe will take far too long to generate. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I go back to the solution for a second, this is a little bit confusing at first, but trust me, it makes sense. Um, all of these star systems are being generated, right? If I click on a star and then I go to the planet, it has to generate this terrain. However, I don't want to generate that terrain until I'm actually visiting the planet. Otherwise, you're going to be running a cellular automata for every planet for every star system which happens to be in view. So you would be running maybe thousands of those every frame and you don't want that, okay? So what happens is when you click on a planet like this, that's when the get terrain function is called. So the get terrain function down here, what you want to happen is the following. You're going to generate the terrain. However, you're gonna generate the terrain and return it. 
However, if you have already generated the terrain for a planet, you don't want to regenerate it, okay? So what does that mean? Well, let me go back to the solution. So if I click here, like this. So the user interface is continuously calling the get terrain function on a planet, okay? So while this planet is being viewed, the terrain functionality of the planet actually exists. So I, whenever I call get terrain, if the terrain has already been generated, I don't want to have to regenerate it. I just want to return what I generated previously. So that's what this function does. So by default, the terrain width, right, the grid that we have, if I go look at the uh, planet dot uh, h, okay, so the terrain is a grid, and by default, it's of size zero. So what I do inside get terrain is say, if that terrain width is zero, it means that I haven't generated the terrain yet. So I set the grid for the terrain equal to the terrain size. It's just going to be a square. So it's got the same width and height. And then I'm going to fill that with zeros. So I filled it all with zeros, meaning that the first color in the colors array is going to be colored everywhere on the planet. And then what I do, just as an example, is I'm going to set one of the terrain values to one. Okay, you're very familiar with the grid class already because of assignment two. So what you do in here, here is where you write your terrain generation slash CA code. So down here, that is where you would generate all the random values and then edit them with the cellular automata, etc. So if you want to, you can make extra functions for that. Just mo don't make extra files. Also, down here, you have to generate uh, the planet's name. And so what we're saying is, if you've generated the name already, don't regenerate it, okay? So if the planet already has a name, then just return the name. Otherwise, if it doesn't have a name yet, set the name somehow, interestingly. And then also you have to set the name for a star system. Down here, uh, the two string and exist functions have been done for you. So please um, don't modify the functions below this comment. And that's pretty much it. It's, it's a little bit complex at first, but once you get into it, I think it's going to be uh, pretty simple to understand. And as soon as you get past that little mental hurdle of how to use the lamer RNG function, it's just setting a bunch of random numbers. It's really not that difficult. Uh, basically, you're going to spend most of your time here, I think, on the terrain generation in order to get those bonus marks for, um, for interestingly generating how the planet looks. Cool. I think I've gone over everything. Um, the rest of it, I mean, I could go over like the user interface. Let me go over the structure of the project a little bit. Uh, so inside the user inter inside the, the file, there's this main.cpp. I've put in this little warning here, uh, warning people that they're using debug mode uh, because people have constantly been messaging me about why their code is running so slow. It's, it's because they... Um, they were using debug mode instead of release mode. Uh, we set up the game engine. Um, there's a there's a few more files here this time than there were last time because like there's different scenes. So there's a scene for viewing the universe. There's a scene for viewing the planet. If you did computer science 4300, you're going to be very familiar with that scene system. Uh, there's this worldview class. This is something that I created in order to implement the zooming and the panning of the user interface. Oh. Um, there's also this VEC2 class. Uh, I use the VEC2 class, essentially VEC2. Again, if you did 4300, you'll be very familiar with this. VEC2 is just a, a vector with two elements, which is an X and a Y. And I use this for some of the calculations inside the user interface. So that's what that's there for. The scene class, this is the base class that does like the drawing of rectangles and quads and stuff for the various scenes. Uh, grid is here as well. You can modify the grid class if you like uh, to make it a bit faster. It's the same as the one I gave out for assignment two. The game engine uh, handles the actual like um, setting up of the window and the changing of scenes, etc. And this assets class is here. You can load uh, sounds or you can load fonts or you can load textures because when you actually run um, the game, there's a texture here, this sun texture. It's kind of hard to see on the stream. 
but this is the texture that we use um, in order to draw the planets. It just has like a little um, furry, or not furry, fuzzy, uh, fuzzy uh, outline. So all of those classes are there. They're all given to you. You absolutely don't need to change any of that stuff unless you end up uh, modifying the user interface for bonus marks. Someone out there asks, is this a custom made engine? Yes, it is completely custom from the ground up. Um, and you can see if you're super interested in how we made that engine, there are details of that um, in the playlist on my channel for... Um, for comp 4300 but it doesn't have entities or any physics or anything like that it's just like drawing and mouse movement because it is it's, it's pretty involved like this took a while to um to actually get up and running um for the solution okay so let's go back real quick to the schedule that's it for the assignment if you have any questions at any time just feel free to ping me on discord i'm sure i'm gonna be i'm gonna be drowning in questions tonight because assignment two is due uh, so yeah, assignment two is due tonight. Uh, if you are watching this, it is probably no longer due tonight. It was due on February 18th at 11.59 p.m. So don't tell me you watched the YouTube video two weeks from now and I said assignment two was still due. So assignment two is due tonight. Assignment three is going to have two weeks. It's a really quick assignment. As soon as you like it's way it's it's pretty quick you can probably bang this out in a night or two so i know that winter break is really uh not a break right you have a bunch of assignments and studying and stuff to do however uh you have two weeks to work on that so the due date is going to be march 4th and i think that's plenty of time uh in order to do that after the break i did want to talk about that a little bit because next turn next week is midterm break um the ordering of these lectures, based on how the assignment is going and stuff like that, that could change. So we still have to go into decision making. Uh, I may go into a little bit more procedural content generation, but I really want to... Here's the catch-22 when it comes to teaching this course. I want as much as possible to teach as many things as possible, but I also want you, like, after assignment four to completely focus on the project, okay? So there will be a fifth assignment, but the fifth assignment is basically just setting up your project. So at some point, you're going to decide what type of project you're going to be working on. I think maybe maybe the first lecture back after the break, I'm going to start immediately talking about the project. So this is going to be, I think, um, uh, project information. I think that's what I'll do. So on March 2nd, I'm going to start talking about the project and give out all the details so you can start forming groups for that um, and working on it. Maybe you're just going to use the same group as your assignments. That's fine. And then uh, the fifth assignment will be like setting up the API for your project, doing like a hello world example, and then showing me a screenshot of that. That's basically what assignment five is going to be. So please don't worry. Uh, assignment three is a bit of work. Assignment four is going to be a bit of work. Uh, but the fifth assignment is like helping you with the project. So the fifth assignment uh, doesn't really um, doesn't really add any work to the course. Uh, yeah. So someone just asked, is there a tutorial to make the game engine? Uh, you can, if you go up to the playlists that were just uh, mentioned in the chat, you can see the computer science forty three hundred lectures. Those will show you how to make that game engine. That that entire course was on making that game engine. So yeah, I hope you all have a great midterm break. I know that this term has been a bit of a a nightmare for some people with COVID and everything. Um, I know it kind of sucks having to stay at home and, and take classes online and all that kind of thing. I sincerely hope that um, the effort I'm putting into creating these assignments is a little bit fun for you, at least. It's not too boring. Um, and I'm always on Discord literally. So at any point, if you're having any troubles or you need an extra bit of time or anything like that, or you can't find a group member for your project, uh, please just let me know. So that's it for today's lecture, I believe. Right after the break, we're going to be talking about the project. So please tune in then. Have a great midterm break, and I will see you on February 2nd.